there are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. You know, one of the greatest banes in society today is the absentee father. If dads would just show up and do their best to do their job being a, a, a husband and a father to their kids, it would solve so many of the world's problems. And I want to share with you five thoughts about fatherhood from the life of the Apostle Paul. My friend, this is a great message. God's Word is going to set you free. I hope you enjoy it. First Corinthians 4, beginning in verse 14. I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, imitate me. For this reason, I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. You might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. People will line up to be instructors, to be imparters of knowledge. In fact, the scripture declares that in the last days, people will heap up teachers for themselves. But to find a true father, or mother in the faith is a rare thing because a spiritual parent truly imparts more than information. It takes commitment to be a true father in the Lord. It means imparting yourself, becoming vulnerable, sacrificing for your sons and daughters. A true father or mother in the faith is watchful in prayer over their sons and daughters, and they rejoice in their progress. And in today's message, I want to share with you five things from these verses that a spiritual father, that a, a true mentor in the Lord will do. Now, Paul actually had a lot of spiritual children, a lot of people he'd won to Christ, but there's only three people that he actually gives the designation of calling his sons in the Lord. It was Timothy, Titus, and Onesimus, and it's actually a a study well worth doing just to look at the lives of those three men and their interaction with the Apostle Paul. But uh, these are things that every spiritual father, parent, mother is going to aspire to. Number one, a true spiritual father delivers his children. They deliver them. Notice the language in verse 14. He says, my dear children, in verse 15, he says, I've begotten you. In verse 17, he calls Timothy his son. You know, Bethany, our daughter-in-law, sitting on the, the front row, well, she and Harrison just had a little boy. Bethany delivered a child. Clay Harrison was born just a few weeks ago. And you know, fathers and mothers in the Lord, they win people to Christ through sharing the gospel. Paul said, I have begotten you through the gospel. You see, sin has separated us from God. The Bible says that the whole world stands guilty before God. And the spirit tainted by sin has to somehow be changed in order to come into a relationship with a holy God. And so Jesus came, sacrificed his life, was raised from the dead, that when we put our trust in him, the Holy Spirit regenerates us, causes us to be born again. And yes, the Holy Spirit does do that work of regeneration, but there must be a certain element present in order for the new birth to come about. Something that the Holy Spirit needs to work with, and that is the seed of the gospel. Again, in verse 15, Paul said, I have begotten you through the gospel. 
1 Peter 1.23 puts it this way. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God which lives and abides forever. You see, spiritual fathers sow seeds just like natural fathers sow seeds. You get a husband and wife, they have relations, she turns up pregnant. They're not going to go, how in the world did that happen? (laughs) No, you know how that happened. And you know, it would be just as crazy for a husband and wife to pray for a baby and never have an intimate relationship as it would be to pray for salvation without sowing the seeds of the gospel. The Holy Spirit works with the seed of the word to bring about the new birth in a person's heart. Number two, they defend their children. Verse 14 He said, I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you through admonition and prayer, more than through any other means, spiritual fathers, spiritual parents defend their children. He said, as my dear dear children, I warn you, I caution you. You know, when I was a little boy, my mother wouldn't let me cross the street by myself. We were living up in the Bay Area. I was like three, and I got mad at my mom and dad, and I ran away. (laughs) Mom found me out sitting on the curb. She said, what are you doing? Says, I ran away. (laughs) Says, why are you sitting on the curb? I said, because you won't let me cross the street. (laughs) Well, she was just protecting me. She had cautioned me. The principle is true when it comes to our spiritual offspring. We admonish them. We warn them. And then secondly, a father defends his children through prayer. Look with me in Galatians chapter 4, and we will come back here to 1 Corinthians, but Galatians, the fourth chapter, Paul makes a most interesting statement. Galatians 4 and verse 19. He said, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. I labor in birth again. Now, he's actually using picture language to describe prayer. Now, you know, all of the guys in here, ladies, we know how easy it is to have a baby. (laughs) Yeah. Now, actually, we're glad that you have them and not us. But this phrase here, labor in birth, he's actually, it's it's the, the phrase in the Greek language, of a woman laboring to give birth to a child. He says, I'm laboring in birth again. Now, the first time is when he shared the gospel with them and prayed them into the kingdom. But now, if you read the book in its context, a group from the Jerusalem church, referred to as the Judaizers, had come in behind Paul. They had come to faith in Christ, but they held the view that in order to truly become a Christian, And for the Messiah to really become a reality in your life, you had to become fully Jewish first. You had to embrace the fullness of the Jewish law, including the right of circumcision. And if you hadn't been circumcised and weren't keeping all the law of Moses, then you couldn't be saved. It was only through the doorway of circumcision in the law that you could actually become a true bona fide Christian. And so they they stirred up a lot of trouble in the church. So Paul warns them and talks to them about it. But he says, look, I'm praying for you. I'm laboring. I'm agonizing for you in prayer as well. You know, in the book of Ephesians, it talks about taking the armor of God and the sword of the Spirit, watching over the saints in prayer. That's one of the main places that we do battle is on our knees. And listen. You know, agonizing prayer, laboring prayer, is not the equivalent of worried prayer. Some people, that's all they do. They just worry to God, but they don't trust Him with anything. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 6, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Don't worry about your children's salvation. Don't worry about your finances. Don't worry about your future. Commit those things to God in prayer, but do not worry about them. Pray down God's influence on whatever or whoever you're tempted to worry about 
and then leave the burden with God. The third thing that spiritual fathers do is they duplicate themselves in their children. They duplicate themselves. Once again, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, Paul said, therefore I urge you, imitate me. Do what I do. He said, I'm going to send Timothy. He's going to remind you of my ways. How, Timothy, how, how can you do that? Because I'm a student of the Apostle Paul. He's duplicated himself in me. And as those that were closest to him, associated with him, they learned his lifestyle, his values, and his attitudes. His life became a blueprint for them to follow. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me in Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now the phrase carefully followed literally means to trace out a pattern. That's what it means in the original language. To trace out a pattern. His spiritual sons observed his life, not just in the good times, but in the hard times. They saw his faith. They saw his determination. They saw his forgiveness. That They saw his commitment to the pathway that God had chosen for him. And they had seen God come through time and time again. It became a pattern for them to follow. You know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, did not, speaking of Titus, did we not walk in the same spirit? Did we not walk in the same steps? And he knew the answer to those questions before he asked them because he duplicated himself in, in the life of Titus. And I honestly think there's very few people that realize the power that a living example can have for good or for bad. You know, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen says to the Jews that had been resisting the Holy Spirit, he said, as your fathers did, so do you. They had unconsciously followed the pattern that was lived out before them. Ezekiel in, in the 20th chapter writes to a backslidden Israel, and he said, your eyes have been upon your father's idols. They had observed the idolatry of their fathers and they had unconsciously followed the same pattern and the same lifestyle. You know, I've had the privilege to know some great ministers of the gospel. Honestly, men and women, that I speak their name with reverence because God used them to shake the world. God used them to, to bring amazing things about. However, all of God's servants have feet of clay. Some of us, we've got clay all the way up to our armpits. God uses faulty vessels because it's the only kind that he has. And one of the things that I had observed in many of these men especially that were princes in the pulpit was that they were dysfunctional as husbands and as fathers. And I watched those that followed them, those that were mentored by them, and they tended to repeat the same pattern. Their wives were basically as good as widows. They didn't ever have time for their children. And that was really a bother to me. I didn't want to repeat that pattern. And I remember I was out to lunch with an older minister one day, and we were talking about some of this, that some of these great men, that their children, that there was a, a, a whole trail of suicides and drug addiction, and dysfunction, and divorce, you know, and, and all of their families. And I remember that old guy said to me, Bayless, if that is success, I don't want it. I never forgot that. And you know, like I said, it was important to me. I wanted to get married, and I knew I was called into ministry. But I, I heard a lot of the old timers say, well, you know, you got to put your wife Second, your ministry comes first. Now, I believe in putting God first. I think the kingdom comes first. But you know what? I, 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 I don't know about putting your ministry before your family. 
And I earnestly searched the scriptures about it. I earnestly prayed about it. And you know, one of the qualifications of being ministry is having your marriage in order and having your family in order. I was actually back in the mountains one time with some friends backpacking before I was married, and I was praying earnestly about it. I said, God, I said, some of these men that I really respect tell me that I got to put, you know, ministry be before my wife when I get married. I, honestly, I don't want my wife to turn out like their wives have turned out. I don't want my kids to turn out like their kids have turned out. I said, w what is it, God? And I felt like the Lord asked me a question. He said, what is ministry? Thought about it a minute. I said, well, it, it's people. He said, good. He said, what's your wife? I said, well, she's a people. Good. He said, your first ministry is to your wife. I think that I need to effectively minister to my bride before I can minister to his bride. And listen, there are sacrifices in ministry. Don't kid yourself. If you feel a calling to ministry, there's going to be sacrifice. But there are God-called sacrifices, and there's ego-driven sacrifices. There's always grace for the sacrifices that God calls for, even if you have to be away for a period of time from your family. There's always grace to cover that. But the ego-driven sacrifices that people make, there is not grace to cover for those. Now, I've done my best to, to, to put my wife first and to always make the, the kids a priority in their lives. And, and our family, we, we've had to make sacrifice over the years. But one of the things that I've always done, besides the family times we have, since the kids were small, every month, each one of the kids had me for one day. I would pull them out of school and say, okay, you've got me from morning until you're too tired, tired to stay up anymore. And whatever you want to do, I'm yours. Every month, one of them had me for an entire day. And Rebecca, she wanted to shop. Or, <laughs> you know, go see a Disney movie. And we'd sit in Beauty the Beast, and I'd cry, and she'd be embarrassed. <laughs> Harrison liked to go surfing. I remember one day I was with Spencer. We spent the whole day running around at the beach, swimming in the ocean. The sun is setting. We're laying on our towels. I said, Spence, what's your favorite thing in the whole world? He said, hanging out with you, Dad. Aww. Yeah, that's, that's what I did. I just went, oh. <laughs> now, hopefully, I've been able to set some sort of pattern for some of the younger people to follow. But you know, good or bad, we are duplicating ourselves in our natural kids and in our spiritual kids. And maybe you were raised in a home where there was an absentee father. I think it's one of the great curses in the world today. But you know what? You can change things with you. You can start a new legacy. You can do it right. You don't have to do it perfect. Nobody does. But you can do it right. You can do it better. It can change with you. All right, the fourth thing a spiritual father does and that the Apostle Paul did is they delegate to their spiritual children. They delegate to them. Again, you know, in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 4, he said, I have sent Timothy to you. Now, Paul sends Timothy to the church at Corinth as his representative. He also gave him other very important tasks. He did the same thing with his son Titus. He did the same thing with his son Onesimus. He entrusted them with very important matters, things that would have a rippling effect that would literally change history. You know, I think of all the mistakes that we've made in the church over the years, and I've made some huge blunders from the pulpit in decisions we've made, but I've, I've made them with a the right heart. And you know what? God has covered every one of those mistakes. I think the church of Jesus Christ is far less fragile than people think. And whatever endeavor you're involved in for God, it's probably far less fragile than you think. And we need to learn to delegate, to give things to people. Now, you may be a hyper micromanager, and you just take everything back because everybody can't do it exactly like you do it. You're going to live a very small life, and you're going to have a very small world. 
If you want things to grow, if you want to have a bigger influence, you have to delegate. You have to make room for it. What if they make a mistake? They will. You did. You're still here. They will make some mistakes. I was fishing one day, saw a dad and his son fishing, and the son hooked what looked like a pretty good fish, and the dad grabbed the fishing pole out of the son's hand and reeled the fish in. He says, oh, that was a great one, son. The boy's like, yeah, I guess so. And then a few minutes later, the boy hooked another fish, and the dad grabbed the rod. The dad's got his own pole, but he grabs the rod out of his son's hand and reels that one in too. The whole time they were there, the father never let the son reel a fish in. He was afraid the son would lose the fish. Oh, I don't want you to lose it, son. Hey, let him lose the fish. Some of those we delegate to, they're going to make some mistakes. Look, this is a safe environment for our kids to make some mistakes. God's big enough, and we have enough grace in our hearts for that, don't we? I mean, is this not a safe environment for people to grow? And so, listen, a a father, a mother in the Lord, they delegate. They, they, They delegate and they leave things. Now, they may do some overseeing, they may do some checking, some instructing, but they don't micromanage every little detail. Entrust things to this upcoming generation. God is still God. He got along fine before you got here and before I got here. He covered our mistakes. He's going to cover theirs as well in Jesus' name. All right. Finally, the final thing is a spiritual father delights in his children. They delight in them. They genuinely love them and are devoted to them. Again, 1 Corinthians 4, this time verse 21. I didn't read that earlier. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? You find out that that permeated Paul's ministry, love and a spirit of gentleness. Yes, he corrected when he needed to, but when he did correct, when he did rebuke, He always insulated in love. He's the one that said, speak the truth in love. Right now, there's electricity coming into the building. It's awesome. It's a blessing. It helps cool the air. It gives us light. It gives us amplification of sound. But those same wires that bring the electricity in, did you know they're all insulated? You take the insulation off of those wires, and that same electricity that's a blessing can be harmful. It can hurt someone. It can even kill them. The truth is not a baseball bat that you hit people over the head with. When you speak the truth, it needs to be insulated in love. And Paul genuinely loved his children in the Lord. In the book of Philemon, he refers to Onesimus as my own heart. You read 1 and 2 Timothy, you become aware very quickly of the deep bond that existed between them. In fact, look with me, if you would, at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice this language that the Apostle Paul uses. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, and verse 7. He said, but we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor, our toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses in God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. You know, the Apostle Paul never looked at his spiritual sons and daughters as cogs in some great gospel machine. He never looked at them as some resource to be used and disposed of. He never looked at them as a resource to be exploited. He genuinely loved them. You know, there was a 
an older minister that I had a friendship with for quite a few years, and um, it meant a lot to me. He had learned more by accident than I learned on purpose. He was much older than me, and I would go spend time with him. And I, I just delighted in it until one day we're together, and he said, Bayless, you know, if you keep coming over, next time you need to bring an offering. And I realized that somewhere along the line that relationship had shifted, and I, I knew he couldn't get out and preach to the degree that he did before, but he wasn't hurting financially. But he'd come to view me as a resource that wasn't being exploited to its fullest potential. And I wasn't against blessing him, but something about it just kind of shattered me. I never went back again. I never visited him again. I realized that the relationship wasn't to him what it was to me. And then I realized many other people came and visited, which was great, but some of them didn't matter what the character issues were as long as they brought their offering. He's willing to spend time with them. Listen, young people and everybody else in here, listen carefully to me. We love you. Whether you contribute or not, you're loved. Now, we hope that you do grow in Christ and you, you use your time and your treasure and your talent for the good of the kingdom. You'll be a blessing to others and it will help grow your life as well. You cannot give away who you are and what you have without God multiplying that back to you. But having said that, that that's our hope for you. But even if you are a non-contributory part of the whole, you're still fiercely loved by God and you're wanted here. You are loved. You're not just some cog in a machine. You're not just some resource to be exploited. You're loved. I hope you believe it because it is true. You are of infinite value to the Creator. He sent His Son to die for you. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, it's important to know that you are loved, not just for what you bring to the table, but just because you are. My friend, you are loved by God, not because of what you can give Him. You're created in His image, and He just loves you. Don't ever forget that, my friend. You are loved by God. See you next time. One person catches the vision. Others join in. As others are included, using their gifts and influence, good progress can be made together. In the church, there is only steady and lasting progress as each generation builds up, supports, and encourages the next. In his book, From Generation to Generation, Bayless Conley outlines the role, responsibility, and opportunity each generation has to connect and build God's church together. Glean from Bayless's experience and practical advice. Use the information on the screen now to order your copy of From Generation to Generation. Thank you for watching Answers with Bayless Conley. For more information and inspiration, visit AnswersBC.org.